11 p.m. seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten and breaking tonight. With 90 children among the victims of the war in Ukraine, according to the General Prosecutor's Office there, can a compromise be found to end this bloodshed? I'll explore in my digest next before getting the view of my superstar panel. Tonight, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and social commentator Esther Kraku. Then we'll cross to Ukraine to meet two extraordinary individuals, the winner of the country's version of MasterChef, who's turned his restaurant into a bomb shelter, and the teacher who, after being forced to flee her beloved Kharkiv, has accused Russia of deliberately targeting civilians. They are at 9.45 this evening. Would a new Russian revolution to stop Putin, the dream scenario for many in the West, just unleash even more carnage onto the world? Author and broadcaster Konstantin Kissin has done the research and thinks so. He's uncancelled at 10.40. And with Michael Gove today announcing the Homes for Ukraine scheme. The scheme will allow Ukrainians with no family ties to the UK to be sponsored by individuals or organisations who can offer them a home. Is it fair to expect the British public to provide refuge for displaced Ukrainians for just £350 a month? We'll debate at 10. Elsewhere on the show, should vaccines have ever been seen as a path out of lockdown? Cyril Cohen, a vaccine advisor for booster-loving Israel, has admitted jabs were not the silver bullet experts hoped they would be because they failed to stop transmission. He'll be the next to give evidence in my lockdown inquiry at 10.20. And was COVID on the loose early in 2019, making lockdowns a total waste of time? Anyway, our positive professor Carol Sakura investigates at 9.30. Who's right in the battle of defining a woman? Is it Keir Starmer or JK Rowling? We'll pick apart what's turning into the ultimate culture war row in the media buzz at 10.30. And after Rebel Wilson delivered perhaps the worst awards show performance of all time, with these unfunny woke gags. And because of the gender pay gap, I actually won't be called 007, I'll be 004.5. Is it time for the BBC to just ax the painfully politically correct BAFTA as well? Comedian Jim Davidson and actor Christopher Biggins say yes, while celebrity agent Jonathan Shallot thinks critics like myself are slandering the entire nation by pillaring the event. It's sure going to be a feisty clash of the lovies. Don't miss it. Plus, as ever, we'll bring you a first look at tomorrow's newspapers. And before the end of the show, I'll crown another Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. This is Dan Wilson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though, it's something I've been campaigning for months and months, and it should have happened a long time ago, but the government today finally scrapped all remaining COVID travel restrictions, meaning the red tape of those vile, intrusive and time-consuming passenger locator forms will go from this Friday morning at 4 a.m. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps said it's back to business as usual for the tourism industry. Finally, uh, we're able to get rid of all of the travel restrictions so there is no more testing, there's no more quarantining, there's no more 
paperwork. And today we will be scrapping the passenger locator form, and this Friday, I should say, uh, meaning that you can travel just like in the good old days. We, we know now that the level of vaccination is so high. Uh, this country, of course, led on vaccinations, but actually around the world as well now it, it's come up. Uh, it means that, that, broadly speaking, you know, it's safe for people to travel around. Uh, of course, we ask people not to uh, go out if the, if the guidance says if you've got COVID, don't travel. But apart from that, uh, it's safe to travel now. And I think it will lead to a big renaissance, people being able to get back together with friends and families abroad. They may not have seen for a very long time. No paperwork is going to make that a lot easier to do and it happens this Friday morning. Of course, this isn't the end of unravelling draconian COVID travel restrictions, including limits on unvaccinated travellers internationally and ludicrous mask mandates that remain at airports and on planes. The fight for the old normal very much continues and I'll be leading the charge here on GB News. Now, my Monday night superstar panel are along shortly to respond to the latest in the peace talks between Ukraine and Russia. It's the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and social commentator Esther Kraku. But before all of that, the news at nine with Tamsin Roberts. And thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. EU member states have approved a fourth round of sanctions against Russian oligarchs and entities. The move comes as Kiev and Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, come under continued bombardment. The UN has confirmed more than 600 civilians, including 46 children, have been killed during the conflict. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmyhal is now urging human rights body, the Council of Europe, to expel Russia. We demand that a decision is approved to immediately oust Russia from the Council of Europe. The ones who definitely support this non-provoked and unjustified aggression cannot stay in the single European family where human life is the highest value. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky released a statement saying Russia has been planning the invasion for some time. We have no right to relax. The Russian state has been preparing for this war for tens of years. They have built up huge military resources for the sake of evil, in order to uproot the neighbors, in order to destroy Ukraine, Europe as we know it and value. The government says there'll be no limit on the number of Ukrainians allowed to stay in the UK. The new Homes for Ukraine initiative opens the door to refugees for up to three years, giving them full access to benefits, health care and employment. Labour's calling it a DIY asylum scheme, but levelling up Secretary Michael Gove told MPs the UK has a long history of helping those in need. The Prime Minister and his Latvian counterpart say President Putin has made a terrible and unforgivable mistake in Ukraine. Boris Johnson and Christianis Karens met at Downing Street this afternoon, ahead of a dinner at Chequers, where the Prime Minister is hosting leaders of Nordic and Baltic countries. Mr Johnson will also hold talks with the group about potential threats from Russia at a summit in London tomorrow. Eight people have been arrested after a protest at a Russian oligarch's mansion in London. Some demonstrators had taken to the balcony of a building which reportedly belongs to Oleg Deripaska. He's one of seven Russians sanctioned by the government last week. A spokesperson for the billionaire says the home is actually owned by his family members. A video has emerged appearing to show the owner of Chelsea Football Club, Roman Abramovich, at an Israeli airport. It's after the Russian was sanctioned by the British government for his links to President Putin. Mr Abramovich was apparently spotted in Tel Aviv, despite being issued with a travel ban. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Dan Whitten tonight. I know it's not what many folk want to hear, and I understand how galling it feels for Ukraine to bend in negotiations with the totalitarian invading Russian regime. But peace talks are now the world's best hope. 
there must be compromise on both sides to end this evil and completely unnecessary war. In fact, it's probably the only way to stop the ongoing killing of thousands of Ukrainian citizens and equally hapless Russian conscripts as Putin's forces struggle to conquer Zelensky's brave and plucky democracy. After two weeks of stalled progress, finally, finally over the weekend, there was reason for a small flicker of optimism. Ukrainian negotiator and presidential advisor Mikhailo Podolkyak claimed Russia now understands Ukraine will not concede in principle on any positions and said the two sides are beginning to talk constructively. Our demands are the end of the war and the withdrawal of Russian troops. I see the understanding and there is a dialogue. I think we will achieve some results literally in a matter of days. While talks were paused today for, quote, technical reasons, for the first time, there appears to be an openness from Russia, too, that a ceasefire agreement could be sealed. Russia MP Leonard Slutsky said there has been substantial progress. He was quoted as telling the IRA news agency, according to my personal expectations, this progress may grow in the coming days into a joint position of both delegations into documents for signing. Of course, exactly what a compromise looks like is the subject of much consternation. The Kremlin has previously demanded Ukraine acknowledge Crimea as Russian territory and recognize the separatist regions of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states. Then there's the thorny issue of future NATO and EU membership, which Ukraine has continually to forcefully pursue. As Colonel Tim Collins, commanding officer of the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Regiment during the Iraq War, wrote in today's Daily Mail, Prolonged attrition can leave Putin's regime without any hope of victory, so that it is forced to negotiate further with Ukraine, whose independence should be the first condition of any such talks. More negotiations could be brokered by China, which is dismayed by the blood-soaked war having been promised by Putin that it would be all over in a few days. With the pressures of its ravenous economy, China cannot endure a global meltdown triggered by prolonged conflict. Now, while Zelensky has insisted we're not ready for capitulation, he has conceded that Ukraine can discuss and find a compromise on how these territories will live on. That may feel un unfair. I understand those calling for NATO to enforce a no-fly zone and risk World War III will think any sort of compromise is a capitulation to a murderous dictator in the mould of Hitler and Stalin. But we must avoid this conflict escalating and dragging the West into armed conflict. It's simply not worth it. We need the invasion of Ukraine to end and can then continue to hammer Putin where it will really hurt him in the long term financially. To respond now, let me bring in my superstar panel, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth, and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Esther, there has to be a compromise, doesn't there? Because the problem is this war could drag on for weeks or even months because Russia doesn't have the forces to, to take the country. Putin miscalculated, but he does have the potential to continue airstrikes which is needlessly killing thousands of Ukrainian citizens. I know, and I think <clears throat> one of, I suppose, an uncomfortable situation for Putin would have to be, you know, de moving forces that have been dedicated on the Kazakh border to Ukrainian territory again, which is not an ideal solution. I think we all knew that this was probably going to be the reality, that, you know, Ukraine would have to concede territory that realistically the powers that be didn't think they were going to keep anyway. I think th the bigger issue here is, and I think you, you um, hit the nail on the head when you discussed, you know, China can't afford this as well. I mean, obviously, at the beginning, we all thought this would... I think Putin thought this would be a lot shorter than it was. But it, where China is concerned, because while China has vocally said, oh, you know, you should have peace talks and all of that, China is still very much Russia's ally in this. And and when you know, Rus Russian businesses were kicked off the SWIFT system, they just hopped onto the Chinese one. So China has played a role in kind of mitigating a bit of the, the effects of the sanctions on the Russian economy. But the reality is this affects us all. This is a, fe this is a global crisis now, and we're all feeling it um, one way or another. So it d definitely this is the way to end, because we, we just can't keep going with this. It's Carol so Malone, do, do you think a compromise is inevitable? <laughs> 
I mean, of course, a compromise is what we want, but I don't believe anything Putin says. You know, he has a habit of pretending he wants to talk peace, and then he uses the, the peace of the talks to, to have a lull, to regroup, to reform his, his forces, and then he attacks again. But, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what ground Ukraine can give. What are they going to do? Give up more land? You know, Russia took Crimea in 2014 illegally. The Russia will no doubt want them to give, to let these two independent states stay independent. And then what are they going to uh, later on? They're going to demand more. I just, I just think that. And one of the things I'm sure will be that they don't want Ukraine to join NATO. Well, it's part of Ukraine's constitution that they they want to join NATO. And, and the bottom line is, if they had been in NATO, this invasion would never have happened. So they're going to press for that even more. They're not going to give the prospect of joining NATO up. But. I just, I just don't believe what Putin says anymore. You know, he's a liar. He's a bully. He cheats. He's, he's not a fair fighter in a war, if there can be such a thing. And I just think, you know, this is a guy who attacked a sovereign nation. You know, the UN Charter says you can't do that, and he did. So why should we believe a single thing he says about... Well, no, he, he's a war criminal, and I don't believe a single thing he says. But, Benjamin, the, the issue I have is that folk who are calling for a no-fly zone are not being realistic about the need to avoid nuclear warfare at all costs. Indeed, I, I heard a, an expert in DC that said the US has wargamed every possible outcome from behaving like that, and almost all of them end in World War yeah, Three. Yeah, I saw that. And so there's basically no dispute about what happens. I mean, look, Ukraine asked for a no-fly zone. Well, what did we do? We banned McDonald's in Russia, so now they've got a no-fry <laughs> zone, uh, which really, wasn't, really isn't going to solve it. Now, look, I, I think Carol hit the nail on the head there, actually, because, you know, you can't trust this man. And I think what he will use in a negotiation is an attack on Chernobyl, is nukes, is chemical warfare like they enacted in Syria. Those are the things, those are the cards that he has left on the table that he's going to play with. And the reason but, that I... So what do you say, though? No capitulation to Putin whatsoever. <clears throat> well, when it comes to things like NATO, you know, the, the argument for, for decades yeah. was that if Ukraine joined NATO, it would spark a war. Well, they didn't join NATO and it did spark a war. He doesn't want, as I think you pointed out, he doesn't want them to join NATO because uh, then that would put them, <laughs> Russia, in a weaker position. I think and may I just add one thing, which okay. is, quickly, which is that... Yeah. If if we if you give in to Russia now, well then they know a weakness, and he's just going to exploit that six and, months and, down the line. And if Ukraine gives up land and gives up these two these two states that have declared independence, well, you know, imagine the, the knock on effect that's going to have around the world. What other separatist movements are going to see that? See Putin get away with it and push for it themselves? You know, in Catalonia, it's it, it, this will have a knock on effect. They can't give up land that is theirs, and they won't. I, I, I understand that, but Esther, is, isn't isn't the point, Esther? Putin actually hasn't got away with this. Regardless of any ceasefire here, there is a fundamental change now in the Western world's relationship with Russia. We're not just going to forget this in a hurry. Of course, and I've been saying it for years, you know, the energy strategy was a complete debacle. Well, we're not going to be well, reliant now on the West on Russian that. energy. This has woken us up to the need for energy independence. And I think any, and I mean, who was that Scottish MP that was saying, you know, we should denuclearize the UK? That, that argument has been effectively Black put Fruit. to bed. Exactly. But I think the bigger issue here is China's looking at this because when, when this conflict first started, one of the bigger fears was, oh, China's next with Taiwan. I think China's learned a lesson from this, but it's also important to, to reiterate that if we do capitulate to Russia's demands, there is a huge likelihood that China will take note of that and say, yeah. OK, well, if we invade Taiwan, they might eventually just capitulate. I mean, obviously, Taiwan's you know, security measures are vastly superior to Ukraine. We must admit that. But that is a very real possibility. Exactly. But, but there are various compromise positions here. And look, you know my views on Putin and this war. I don't want to bow down to Putin. But... Unfortunately, the guy is going to declare victory in some way, Carol. But, what, but, but we what know he has succeeded. What, what can Ukraine concede? They, there they were, an independent country, doing nothing, saying nothing, and Russia invaded. What are they, they going to concede? They're going to have to give up land that is there. That's what this has been. It's a land grab back Well, here. now this falls, onto the bit, west. this falls onto the West. This is something This is something we should have done in 2014. When, uh, completely. Russia, in Crimea, first, completely. And, Crimea, and that is there should be a peacekeeping force. 
there should be a hard line from now on that if Russia but chooses to step back, there is going to be consequences. But let's not say that. We say that, but we, we spend... No, but there needs to be action Years and it. years are spent there appeasing this guy. But let's you, can, you can bet that after this, Ukraine and other US allies will be arming up like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, but they already, there, let's there's look, no point. They, Russia already has... Crimea. We did capitulate in 2014. Of course, there, no there, there, there could be certain fudges like Donetsk, Luhansk. Is there a referendum, for example, about uh, whether the they stay independent or not? <laughs> I mean, look, all I'm saying is that we need to avoid a very lengthy war. Mm. Ukraine will be blown to smithereens mm. if it goes on like this for weeks and weeks. So, I embrace the rhetoric coming from the peace talks. I think Zelensky, who's proven to be a very effective leader, is right to say we have our bottom lines, but we do want to negotiate and we want the West to negotiate. I think it's a sensible strategy. And Let's just be clear about who's on the back foot, though, because US intelligence mm -hmm. said that Putin expected to take Ukraine in 15 days. Well, Monday, today, is day 19, and he's nowhere near that. And so, Benjamin, so, what do we push Putin towards then? Well, the truth De is... Deploying nuclear activity. The, the only reason he's entertaining peace talks is because his position is not what he expected and because to do. The, And he's going to be in a weaker and weaker position uh, as more of his troops and his rubbish equipment and his useless tanks of course, are destroyed. But, of course, but, but he has nuclear weapons. He has a huge array of bombs that he can unleash on Ukraine if he wants. So give him what he will claim to the Russian people to be a victory. And they will know full well very soon that it's not when they can't go to the and they can't you've get money it. out on the bank and they can't buy furniture. You've at the kind of hit the nail on the head there. He is in a corner now and he will have to save face for his own people. So there has to be, it has to look like Ukraine have given in. But literally, but, but I don't think they'll actually do that. I think what's happening now, though, and what might happen sooner than we think, is, is, is Russia will economically implode. Exactly. It's happening already. Exactly. And, and that's the best pressure. We're going to bring you some yeah. brilliant footage later in the show, actually, of one of the main Russian news bulletins tonight uh, being taken over mm. by, by a protester. So there is resistance building in Russia and it will take time. And the whole thing with the financial we sanctions yeah. and the economic activity is this is a long game. It's months and years. But the short term goal is to stop the killings in Ukraine. We have to because we can't keep witnessing these scenes. Because, we but, can't but, you know, I'm this sorry. Wednesday these scenes is the time day. when Russia has, is due to pay. It's due to default on a massive mm. debt payment. If it does, it is really in trouble. And it hasn't done. I that. just think you hand them Donetsk to end this, and they'll be back for more before you can believe I it. Think well, can be I right. don't know. I think that. The it will compromise its its regional authority in a way, and I don't think that's a good look okay. for anyone. Well, Esther Kraku, Benjamin Budworth, Carol Malone, do stand by. My superstar panel, they're here all night. But also still to come, was COVID on the loose early in 2019? Making lockdowns a total waste of time. Our positive professor Carol Sakura investigates soon. But up next in The Clash, is it time for the BBC to axe the painfully politically correct BAFTAs? Comedian Jim Davidson and celebrity agent Jonathan Shallot thinks critics like myself, or Shallot does anyway, are slandering the entire nation by pillaring the event. But I want to know what you think, especially if you saw the BAFTAs last night. I thought they were dreadful. Dan at GBNews.UK is my email address, at GBNews on Twitter. We've also got a poll running there, which you can vote in now. Back soon. Good evening. Turning a bit misty in a few places overnight. Could be some early fog patches around tomorrow. But once that's gone, for the vast majority, it's going to be a dry, fine day. A bit chilly first thing, but um, quite mild by the afternoon. The UK's surrounded by weather fronts, but um, they're not really making much in the way of rainfall. This one approaching the northwest will bring a wetter day tomorrow across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. We do have some showery rain across the northeast of Scotland this evening. That is fizzling away. One or two scattered showers over East Anglia and the southeast, uh, but equally they are pretty well scattered and most places are dry, but we are going to see some mist and fog patches forming across parts of the Midlands and southern England and temperatures dropping down close to freezing, certainly in rural spots a touch of frost to start Tuesday, but generally a fine sunny start. The mist and fog patches in the south 
will only take a few hours to clear away, but they could easily be there through the morning rush out. There's that weather front coming in, bringing some rain to the highlands, the Western Isles and more Western parts of Northern Ireland. But I say ahead of it, most places dry and bright and temperatures, look at that. Across England and Wales, 13 in Manchester, 13 or 14 in Norwich, maybe 15 or 16 in London. Cooler with the rain edging into Western Scotland and Northern Ireland that continues to track through the central belt and across uh, through uh, the Belfast area during the course of the evening and um, some uncertainty about the position of that line of rain on Wednesday, joined by another weather front bringing uh, a different day for the Midlands and the eastern parts of England on Wednesday with more cloud and some outbreaks of rain that could be heavy in places as well. For the west, it's looking like it'll turn drier and brighter, certainly a brighter day for Western Scotland, Northern Ireland. Temperatures similar, whereas again, of course, the east, that's where we'll have the highest temperatures. And if we see some sunshine poking through, we could get up to 15 or 16 degrees. A few showers across the north on Thursday, but apart from that, into the weekend, plenty of sunshine and temperatures widely in the teens. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Time now for The Clash. And the award for the wokest and most dreadful award ceremony yet goes to the 2022 BAFTAs. Most of the blame for Boring the Nation lies with Aussie Rebel Wilson, who botched her BBC hosting duties last night with two hours of painfully unfunny politically charged gags. But lovely celebs in attendance also just couldn't help themselves with virtue signalling a plenty from the likes of Benedict Cumberbatch, Emma Watson and the man who played Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, Andy Serkis. Have a look at their most cringe moments. We have brothers and sisters who are suffering in our industry who are in Ukraine. Everyone needs to do as much as they can. I think already today the news has broke that there's been a record number of people volunteering to take people into their homes and I hope to be part of that myself. That was me two years ago, and since then I've done quite a transformation. I hope J.K. Rowling still approves. <laughs> and because of the gender pay gap, I actually won't be called 007. I'll be 004.5. Our next presenter is Emma Watson. She's proud to call herself a feminist, but we all know she's a witch. I'm here for all of the witches. <laughs> Uh, whilst hopefully creating an atmosphere that inspires, is inclusive and values every single member of that family equally. Um, so it's no surprise that uh, 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 Pretty Patel on her debut feature, Hostile Environment, found 
enormous problems and that her follow-up movie, uh, All Refugees Are Welcome But Some Are More Welcome Than Others, is a complete nightmare. And if that wasn't bad enough, proceedings reached a new low when Rebel wailed out a member of staff for another of, of her dire quips, only for the most ridiculous episode of COVID theatre to be played out. So have a look at this. Spot how these snobbish A-listers get to watch on unmuzzled, chuckling away at the poor assistant who has a cloth mask covering her face after serving a cake that, of course, is vegan. Clearly, in spite of all the virtue signalling, the little people don't seem to matter as much at the BAFTAs, and neither do the viewers. As I wrote in my Mail Online column today, unless the BAFTAs are prepared to enter the real world, the BBC should stop wasting licence fee payers' money and two hours of Sunday night primetime to broadcast such self-congratulatory nonsense. So, following all of that wokeness that played out in last night's ceremony, should the BBC now act? the BAFTAs. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Email me, dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet me at gbnews. We've got our poll running there too. I'll bring you the results shortly, but to help you make up your mind, let me bring in a trio of showbiz heavyweights in their own right. The comedian Jim Davidson, the acting legend Christopher Biggins, and celebrity agent extraordinaire Jonathan Shallot, who got to see last night's travesty play out in person. Now, Biggins, you're with me on this, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, it was a travesty last night. I didn't recognise anybody. The people who presented the awards were new to me. I thought they were sort of stagehands who were coming on to present <laughs> the awards. I didn't know any of them. It was the dullest thing ever. And, you know, the, the, we, the awards used to be so good and they, we used to copy the Americans who do it so brilliantly. And now it was just appalling last night. The only good thing about it was Shirley Bassey mm. and she sang storm and looked wonderful and, and I thought oh my god this is going to be the most wonderful evening ever and it turned out to be dire. I know and that was right at the top of the show and of course then James Bond only won one out of uh, the four awards they were nominated for. The rest of the winners were movies we'd actually never heard of Jim Davidson. Well I didn't watch it and, and of course the winners are all uh, winners of, of films that no one wants to see or no one's ever going to see. I don't know what's about, I don't watch it because it, I'm in the other side of the show business that, you know, gets out and gets laughs. I mean, uh, I mean, and you know why the staff were wearing masks, don't you? They're probably so why? embarrassed to be seen with all this lot. That's what it is. Saying, Please don't, don't get me involved with all this. No, the loveys are, are loveys and, 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 and and I tend to stay away from him, unless, of course, it's Chris Biggins, who, who I am in love with. I, he, he is uh, a fantastic uh, actor. And all actors don't have to be the complete lovies, do they? There's great actors. They, I'm they, looking at one they, next to me now. <laughs> Jonathan Shallot, OK, wh wh why are Jim and, and Biggins and myself, why are we wrong on the BAFTAs? Well, first of all, you've just criticised 2.8 million people. So clearly, 2.8 million people enjoyed the BAFTAs, but the three of you didn't. So I think there's a bit of an inequity in the numbers here. Secondly, the BAFTAs reflect what the British public vote for and what British people go and watch at the movies. So you may be right, people might not have heard of some of the films, but that's what the public voted for and the BAFTA committee voted for. So I think that is what reflects the culture this year. It may be next year. It's worse. It may be better. I think your argument applies to all award ceremonies. All award ceremonies do is reflect what happened to the year before. And clearly, in the, in the minds of the three of you, what happened in the last year in the movies was terrible. So 2.8 Well, no, I think there's been better. great movies. But the point is, they're not the movies that are nominated for the BAFTAs anymore. And Biggins, there has been a real change on that front. Because if you look, even two decades ago, you had movies like The Lord of the Rings and Titanic would win, you know, big blockbusters. That went down and well. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, they were great. And the, the, the awards are good because, it, you know, it encourages people to go to the cinema. But this would disappear yesterday. This encourage anybody going to the theatre, to the cinema, to see these films. Jim Davidson, what do you think about 
Jim Davidson, what do you think about these celebrities who feel a need to politically virtue signal at these events? So you had Benedict Cumberbatch on the red carpet saying he hopes to take in a Ukrainian uh, refugee. I would say there's more chance of that happening than uh, his director, uh, Jane Campion, making a film that makes any sense. But, but yeah. what, what do you make of it when they take over these ceremonies to politically pontificate? Well, it's, it's what people do. It's their chance to get on the soapbox. Ask him if he'll take in a veteran that's homeless, that's fought in many wars uh, for our hey. country. No, that, that's, not, that's not lefty enough. I mean, I, I don't mind all these guys. They're all lefties. They all get together and sit around and do the Guardian crossword, but they're not in the real world. And this girl, is she funny? Then I'm in the wrong job. Jonathan Charlotte <laughs> will probably tell me that anyway. Jonathan, come on. Even within the Royal Albert Hall, it felt like everyone was just cringing at this god-awful performance by Rebel Wilson. I actually think she's now the worst awards show host in British history. She, she's actually even overtaken. Do you remember Sam Fox and, and, and Mick Fleetwood back at 1989 hosting yeah. the Brit Awards? She was even worse than them, Charlotte. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't disagree there. I don't think Rebel Wilson will be hosting the BAFTAs next year. I think uh, I think they'll go back to a traditional presenter like Graham North or Jonathan Ross next year. I think they've had a few years not getting it right. But I, I can see sort of Graham North and back there. Jim, isn't the point that these awards shows are just over? We don't want them anymore. We don't want to see the Oscars. We don't want to see the Golden Globes. We are sick of being preached to by multi-millionaire, out-of-touch actors. Well, it's the thing is, is that they say, and the winner is, and they say all, all the people are nominated, and the winner is Bert Smith, and all the others go, oh, lovely. Have an award for comedians. There'll be a punch-up within 20 minutes of it all. You don't deserve that. I mean, it is just full of self-licking ice creams, aren't they? It really is ridiculous. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Jonathan, 2.8 million people uh, watched it. But the three honest people here now saying we didn't like it. I haven't heard from the others. No. We, the three of you do have one thing in common. None of you have been nominated for a BAFTA, so perhaps you're a wee bit jealous. Oh, Ooh, God, I would yeah. not want to turn up to any BAFTA event. Hello. Do you, do, you, do, you know, do, you, do you know, Biggins, the moment when I decided that the film industry has lost the plot was when Emma Watson introduced the, out, uh, the outstanding British film gong. And by the way, it should have gone to a brilliant little movie called Belfast, which was actually great. Of course, that didn't win. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and she, she, she read out uh, her little citation and she said, our industry is blessed with so many diverse voices exploring ideas of sexuality, race, religion and identity, different ways of being. Our creative talents are brave enough to explore the past because they're eager to face the future. And I just thought, oh my goodness, she genuinely believes that films are to push a far left political agenda rather than to entertain us. I know. It's crazy. Well, that is the who, who, who wants to go first? Biggins, you go first. <laughs> sure. Well, I think that is absolutely. You no, know, it's it's now become you know, ridiculous, the whole situation of what, you know, the, 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 uh, the thing that we're in at the moment is this whole business of you've got to be political to win something or to, or to give something or to look after something. I mean, it's all so wrong. Everybody, I mean, Jim Davidson, I'd rather see Jim Davidson every single night on television. But why isn't he there? Because, Jim, you're brilliantly funny. You're clever. You're witty. You make people laugh. None of these people have that quality at all. And, you know, I, I, I mean, do you know those wonderful dirty pantomimes you used to do, they were fantastic. And I did Jim, one for you. Do you feel like you could yes, get you on you mainstream the TV these days, Jim? Would you ever be invited to the BAFTAs or have people in uh, the lovey industry decided you're too controversial? 
Yeah, there's lots of people. It's not just the Baptists. It's the theatres and everybody. Us comedians, us, as Danny LaRue used to say, us wandering minstrels from the variety, we have to cross that threshold into loviness. And where you have to work with all these lovey theatre people and say, we don't really want you here. You sell out everywhere and you get standard ovations, but we don't particularly like you. You vote Conservatives as well, I've heard. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Why not listen to what people want? rather than what the lovies want. You know, Jonathan, I understand you. You're a great agent, I'm told. And, 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 and you know, <laughs> it's time for the people to have a say. Not all these lovies saying, oh, let, oh, I voted for this film because there were, there were a diverse... Um, what about jokes and fun and drama without political statement? Now, what's it, happened it, to it, that, it, Jonathan? It, what's happened to that? Well, I, I, what I would say is I think there are two issues here. I think the films that were released in the last year are the films released in the last year. It's no different than television shows. It's no different than music. You've got what you've got to vote for, and that's the reflection of the films of the last year. What I would say, though, is if Biggins and Davidson had been hosting the BAFTA Awards last night, it would have been a lot better. Yes, it would. Well, there's an idea for the BBC. By the way, uh, just a quick final note. Have any of you seen this The Power of the Dog, which won Best Film? It's on Netflix. No, thank you. Well, it was a film because my dog has decided to drag his bum across the carpet with his front paws. Uh, and he didn't get that from me. He must have seen Michelle do it. So I'm right <laughs> up on the I watching it. Well, all I'll say, you're not missing anything. You're not missing anything. That was comedian Jim Davidson, the acting legend Christopher Biggins and the celebrity agent Professor Jonathan Chris. Shallot. Thank you all. So who do you agree with? Well, Debbie on Twitter says, I haven't watched the BAFTAs for about five years due to celebrities spouting what their political beliefs are. I don't need or want to be preached to. I watch TV because I want to be entertained. Philip on Twitter says, loveys will be loveys. When they do what they're paid for, they are good. I don't agree with the politics, but I still appreciate the talent. I also quite enjoy the 90 minutes of swearing at the TV. That was me last night, Philip. And Sidley, also via Twitter, says, better if the woke BBC was axed. And that's something I can certainly get on board with. Defund it now, I say. Your verdict is in. 93% of you agree with Jim Davidson, Christopher Biggins and myself that the BBC should axe the BAFTA. Just 7% of you want the snob fest ceremony to continue into another year. Well, coming up, two extraordinary individuals. The winner of Ukraine's version of MasterChef, who's turned his restaurant into a bomb shelter, and the teacher forced to flee her beloved Kharkiv, who's accused Russia of deliberately targeting civilians. They are tonight's On the Ground Insiders, live from Ukraine in just a few minutes' time. But next, was COVID on the loose early in 2019, making lockdowns a total waste of time? Our positive professor, Carol Sakura investigates immediately after the break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions. Big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Time now for our Positive Professor, Carol Sikora. It's a question that was dismissed as a conspiracy theory at the start of the pandemic. Was COVID-19 circulating well before December 2019, making lockdowns a disastrous waste of time? Now, it's been brought to the fore thanks to a series of viral tweets by the great Barrington Declaration author, Dr. J. Bhattacharya, citing studies from the previous two years revealing that COVID antibodies were found in European blood banks as early as September 2019. Now, Dr. Bhattacharya, a professor of medicine at the prestigious Stanford University, told this program that he aimed to, quote, start a conversation about the implications of those findings, which had not received enough of a public hearing, in his view, given their importance. Well, you know, here is where we have the conversations the mainstream media and elite don't want to entertain. So let me bring in Professor Carol Sikora now. Carol, this is fascinating evidence, isn't it, which has uh, received scant attention in the media and hardly any analysis by professional bodies. But it seems increasingly clear to me that COVID was already on the loose in September 2019. Uh, is that what you've concluded too? I'm afraid so. It does mean the whole lockdown strategy, other than flattening the peak, we had no effect on the spread of infection. You know, there's other data out there. This recent data is from blood banks where you go and volunteer, give blood, serum is stored for years. So you just go and look where the antibodies started to appear. And it does look from that data, it appeared about September time. The other less obvious way to look where the virus originated, the time it originated, is to go around sewage works. Sewage works are very good about quality control and they store the effluent uh, in samples. And you just go back there and look for the bits of RNA that's the virus in, in the sewage. And again, you could see that in September and October, long before Wuhan. I was actually in Wuhan on the 31st of October of that year. I've got a stamp in my passport to say. And uh, I went to the cancer center there and none of us knew anything about it. The, the Chinese doctors, the cancer center doctors knew nothing about this, obviously. And it broke in this untimely way with panic, lockdown all around the world, then the shutting of borders. And only today has it been announced that these boring passenger locator forms for Britain mm. will be thrown out the window. And it's about time we do that. Well, about time, I would say probably 18 months too late, but I do embrace it. Especially, Carol, when you look around the world and you see Hong Kong locking down entirely again as the communist Chinese regime forces this once independent city state to pursue a zero COVID strategy. When are these idiots going to learn? You know, it'll do no good. Um, it, yeah, zero COVID is not possible. It's like saying we're going to have a zero flu strategy. How can you achieve that? You vaccinate people. Sure, that does one thing. You then institute quarantine as soon as someone gets the illness. It's no good. The viruses are far too powerful, infectious agents to do that. They've honed over many years of evolution to be perfect evolutionary wizards at continuing their infection. You know, I always like to think they travel first class when they go around the world. They travel in the, the gold lounges of airlines. They go in they first skip class. They the queue. Exactly. They go through the thing. Um, they don't have to show passports anywhere. Uh, they're vehicles of infection. And the lockdown is such a crude thing to do. And of course, as you know, and I know, it has very profound effects on other illnesses, such as cancer, which is my field, but also heart disease, strokes, all these things. People suffer unnecessarily because of the lockdown. And, you know, hopefully, 
the governments have learned. We've actually done not badly compared with a lot of governments in Europe. Uh, there's no doubt the decisions which have been criticised. Uh, chairman of the BMA criticising all the time. The hospital uh, chairman criticising again. You know, we've just got to believe in ourselves and say, let's get back to normal just as quickly as possible. Carol, on that note, I've been seeing a lot of the usual suspect COVID hysterics trying to whip everyone who's still scared into a frenzy over the past few days over increased COVID infection rates. I'm not at all concerned. Are you? No. The, the one single figure to look at is the number of people on ventilators, and that is static, 250. Okay. About a half of those are on ventilators for other reasons than COVID. They do have COVID infection, but they're not on the ventilator primarily because of COVID. They've had problems, they've had respiratory infections, they may have neurological problems which are stopping them breathing, but they're counted as COVID patients. So at 250 in a population in hospital beds of 141,000, that's pretty small. And, you know, it's just not moving up. Uh, a little uptick in the number of people that are positive to COVID really doesn't mean very much. It's how severe the COVID is in people. If the ventilation patients were going up, there would be cause for concern. But they're staying right down, lower than they've ever been. OK, good news. Carol Zakora, our positive professor, thank you so much. I do like it when you bring us good news. Coming up, is it fair to expect the British public to provide refuge for Ukrainians fleeing the war for just £350 a month. My superstar panel return to debate that straight after 10. The next, we cross live to Ukraine to speak with the winner of the country's version of MasterChef, who's turned his restaurant into a bomb shelter, and the teacher forced to flee her beloved Kharkiv, who has a first-hand account of the destruction there straight after the break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. We're back and breaking tonight. The regional governor for Ukraine's northern Rivni region has said that at least nine people have been killed, with another nine wounded in a Russian airstrike on a television tower. The news comes after another Russian airstrike on a residential building in Kharkiv killed two people earlier today, according to the Kharkiv Emergency Services. The UN now estimates over 2.6 million Ukrainian refugees have fled the violence so far in what is now an unquestionable humanitarian crisis. 
But one local celebrity has taken it on himself to use his skills to continue feeding the Ukrainian people as the Russian shelling reigns around them. Yevgen Klopotenko won the country's version of MasterChef in 2015 and runs a restaurant in Kiev. With the war raging in his country, Yevgen decided to turn the successful business into a bomb shelter and kitchen to serve food to local residents in need of a hot meal. But as the fighting worsened around the capital, Yevgen was forced to flee, but has continued to serve starving Ukrainians fleeing the war through his roaming kitchens. And he joins me now from Lviv. It's so lovely yeah. to have you here, Yevgen. Obviously, feeding the country at a time of war is so important. So can you tell me how are the food supplies working? Are any cities running out of food? Oh, so hi, everyone. Uh, like, uh, it's a different situation in different cities. For example, in Kiev, it was like a one situation. Uh, for the first uh, three days, it was like uh, very hard. And then a lot of uh, volunteers uh, started to help. And now uh, in my restaurant, uh, my team is uh, cooking for uh, 1,000 and a half, uh, uh, 1,500 people a day. And a lot of uh, a lot of uh, chefs in Ukraine, they, like in Kyiv only, they serve like, a, I don't know, one, 100,000 for the, the dishes per day. So supplement now is good, but uh, we, we don't know what what food will be brought like uh, next day. So uh, just every day is some different products and we cook from what we can. Uh, but if we say about the Kherson, which are occupied, uh, it's a much more worse situation. About Mariupol, about Nikolai, it's much more worse. But uh, in um, um, in the West Ukraine, where I'm now, uh, uh, here are a lot of refugees now uh, from all the of Ukraine, and uh, here is with climate much more better because it's uh, uh, not far from the border for the from the Poland, you know, and uh, the products which are hard to find in in uh, Ukrainian like um, uh, stocks, you can buy it uh, in Poland. But the main thing that uh, in in Ukraine, all organism like everyone is working for the for the future for to, to win Russia. We like if you don't have products, you can call to your friend, and your friend will call to your friend and will help. So we don't have the problems like a huge problems uh, for the. For the products now in the uh, in the most of Ukraine, but some parts okay. which are occupied by Russia, yeah. And and you're committed to stay in Yevgen? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm I'm staying now in Lviv for the for the few weeks because I hear it like a huge amount of people, you know, because war, war it's not only about soldiers, it's about supplement. And here, like a lot of refugees don't have the food, and that's why I I, I understand that I going to be better here to organize everything and while my restaurant uh, still is working like a bomb shelter and like a restaurant uh, and uh, I will see what I will do like uh, next uh, next week because every every day every week everything is changed I see I feel that here uh, I will cook for the guys who is who will be living in the trains you know and that's you you know showing the uh, the army kitchen our army cuisine and it's like a totally different way of cooking it's not like a Oh, high, high, high culinary, you know, uh, this uh, thing is like just to to, yeah. to, to make, to, to stay people alive because food is... Well, I have to life, say, they're, they're very lucky to have you cooking for them. I'm sure you're give, giving them a little yeah. bit of joy at, at a very difficult time. That was Ukrainian master chef winner and Thank celebrity you. chef Yevgen Klopentenko. And breaking tonight, the mayor of Kharkiv has appeared on primetime Ukrainian TV to claim Russian forces have been continually shelling the city for the past 24 hours, focusing on, he says, civilian residential areas, which have left an unspecified number of casualties. One local resident is teacher Julie Lasser, who believes Putin forces have been exclusively targeting citizens since they encircled the city over 19 days ago. And despite her reluctance, it was this horrific bombardment which eventually forced her and her family to flee under the cover of darkness two weeks ago as rockets and bombed rained down around them. Not knowing if they'd have a home to return to, Julie and her family made the seven-day journey out of Kharkiv to safety, having at times slept on strangers' couches. But I'm happy to say that I'm joined now by Julia and her nephew, uh, Dania. Uh, Levchenko. Great to see you both. Uh, do you have any idea on the situation in Kharkiv right now? Are you in touch with people who have stayed in the city? Because it sounds bad, Julia. It sounds very bad. 
Yes, yes. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my elder sister, she is staying in Kharkiv, and they are being severely bombed right now. And uh, we are making a kind of roll call every day because I have friends who couldn't leave the city. And uh, of course, uh, every morning I try to get a message from them, a message that they are alive, uh, that everything is okay with them. And Dania, for, 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 for a guy of, of your age, it must just be absolutely shocking to be living through a war. How are you coping with this psychologically? Uh, yes, I agree with you. It's very shocking for me and for all my group mates from my university. Uh, we, I think... I, we hope for better future, for better days. We hope that we will win and all the world will help us. But actually, it's very hard nowadays because there are a lot, there are millions of people who don't have home, who don't have food and money to survive nowadays. So yeah, it's very hard to believe and hope. It, indeed, and you were at university just a couple of weeks ago, and and now look at the country. Uh, that you love and what it has been reduced to, unfortunately. Julie, we spoke at the top of the show about these ongoing uh, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. How do you feel about the prospect of some sort of compromise which your President Zelensky has hinted over the weekend could be possible? Is it worth some sort of compromise in order to stop the killing of Ukrainian civilians? You know, uh, I'm, we are so happy that ha we have Zelensky as our president. We trust them and we know that uh, he is doing his best and our government uh, are doing his, uh, their best to stop the war. But this is our country. We cannot uh, compromise with our territory, with our people. We love our country. We don't need these liberators on our territory. They hoped that within two days, uh, we will, um, they will see Ukrainian people meeting them with flowers. On the contrary, they united us, everyone, everyone in Ukraine to, to to fight, to fight for our freedom. Sir, uh, we support our president. Indeed. And well, look, thank we you both. We so to the whole world for the help, for the support. And uh, we, we hope that uh, at the end, the, uh, the, the sky over Ukraine will be closed because now, we have so many people that are being killed every day, every minute, and uh, they destroy. They are dis they have destroyed ninety percent of the second largest city in Ukraine. I know when you put it like that, it, it, it's an atrocity that has been committed against Kharkiv, and 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 I just hope uh, that that your city gets through this. That's Julia Lassa and Dania Levchenko joining us uh, from Lviv, where, where they have fled. It's 10 p.m. I'm Dan Wooten and breaking tonight as local officials report more than 2,500 citizens have died in Mariupol. An evacuation convoy of about 160 cars has left the city in the first successful attempt to arrange a humanitarian corridor after last week's efforts were interrupted by Russian shell fire. People fleeing the besieged port city have described the conditions there as horrifying. And as the UK government steps up its efforts to accept more refugees, like those fleeing Mariupol, is it fair to expect the British public to be the ones to provide refuge for Ukrainians fleeing the war for just £350 a month? My superstar panel will return to debate that next. Tonight, I'm joined by Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and social commentator Esther Kraku. Plus, you'll get a first look at how tomorrow's newspaper front pages cover the Ukraine crisis throughout the next hour. 
our hopes of ending the war with a palace coup, a fatal underestimation of Putin's popularity in Russia. Author and broadcaster Konstantin Kissin has done his research and has a word of warning for the West. That's an uncancelled at 10.40. Elsewhere on the show, does the failure of COVID jabs to curtail cases prove that policies like vaccine passports are not only morally wrong, but actually completely ineffective? Cyril Cohen, a vaccine advisor for Booster Loving Israel, answers that and more as he gives evidence in my lockdown inquiry at 10.20. As J.K. Rowling slams Keir Starmer's claim that trans women are women and savages the Labour Party's commitment to women's rights, Who's correct in the battle for defining what a woman really is? Plus, exchange father Thomas Markle used the launch of his YouTube channel to make this bombshell pledge to give evidence against Meghan. My daughter and her, her uh, uh, ginger husband uh -huh. in a courtroom. I'd be thrilled to come to court and, and talk and defend my oldest daughter. Whoa, we'll tackle all of that in the media buzz at 10.30. Plus, just before the end of the show, a brand new Greatest Britain and Union Jackass will be crowned. But now, the news headlines at 10 with Tamsin Roberts. Dan, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. EU member states have approved a fourth round of sanctions against Russian oligarchs and entities. The move comes as Kiev and Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, come under continued bombardment. The UN has confirmed more than 600 civilians, including 46 children, have been killed during the conflict. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal is now urging human rights body, the Council of Europe, to expel Russia. We demand that a decision is approved to immediately oust Russia from the Council of Europe. The ones who definitely support this non-provoked and unjustified aggression cannot stay in the single European family where human life is the highest value. A protester against the invasion has interrupted a live news broadcast on Russian state television, Channel One. The woman, who is said to work for the broadcaster, entered the studio behind the presenter, holding a sign and telling viewers they're lying to you. She could be seen and heard before the channel switched to alternative output. It's reported the woman has been arrested and taken to a police station in Moscow. The government says there'll be no limit on the number of Ukrainians allowed to stay in the UK. The new Homes for Ukraine initiative opens the door to refugees for up to three years, giving them full access to benefits, health care and employment. Labour's calling it a DIY asylum scheme, but levelling up Secretary Michael Gove told MPs the UK has a long history of helping those in need. The Prime Minister and his Latvian counterpart say President Putin has made a terrible and unforgivable mistake in Ukraine. Boris Johnson and Christianis Karens met at Downing Street this afternoon ahead of a dinner at Chequers, where the Prime Minister is hosting leaders of Nordic and Baltic countries. Mr Johnson will also hold talks with the group about potential threats from Russia at a summit in London tomorrow. Eight people have been arrested after a protest at a mansion in London linked to a Russian oligarch. Some demonstrators had taken to the balcony of the building, which reportedly belongs to Oleg Deripaska. He's one of seven Russians sanctioned by the government last week. A spokesperson for the billionaire says the home is owned by his family members and not him. A video has emerged appearing to show the owner of Chelsea Football Club, Roman Abramovich, at an Israeli airport. It's after the Russian was sanctioned by the British government for his links to President Putin. Mr Abramovich was apparently spotted in Tel Aviv, despite being issued with a travel ban. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Dan Wooten tonight. Time for tomorrow's news tonight now on our media buzz. First front pages, I've got them hot off the press. 
And the Metro leads with the protesters who stormed the empty £50 million mansion of a Russian oligarch and claimed they had liberated it before inviting Ukrainian refugees to move into the property. The oligarch who owns the London property is described as Russian President Vladimir Putin's favourite industrialist. Uh, I do think the rule of law still has to apply in this country, however. In the I newspaper, UK families open homes to refugees as 37,000 sign up to a government hosting scheme for Ukrainians fleeing war in the first four hours. Britain rallies against Putin, says The Sun. The paper, they actually have a different figure. They say 25,000 Brits have offered to take in some of the almost 3 million people who have fled Ukraine since Putin ordered the Russian invasion. And my superstar panel back with me now, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and social commentator Esther Kraku. Now, breaking tonight, Ukraine has evacuated 4,000 people from frontline cities today, according to the country's deputy prime minister. The announcement came hours after Michael Gove formally announced that Homes for Ukraine scheme that's dominated the front pages, allowing Brits to sponsor refugees fleeing Russian violence and house entire families for six months or more. The scheme will allow Ukrainians with no family ties to the UK to be sponsored by individuals or organisations who can offer them a home. There will be no limit to the number of Ukrainians who can benefit from this scheme. The scheme will be open to all Ukrainian nationals and residents. They will be able to live and work in the United Kingdom for up to three years. They will have full and unrestricted access to benefits, healthcare, employment and other support. And as I told you earlier in the show, uh, Uber lovey Benedict Cumberbatch declared to the world's press on last night's BAFTA red carpet that he's going to try and he hopes to get involved with the scheme. Not surprisingly, he's not the only high-profile name turning the crisis into an opportunity for high-profile virtue signalling. Former Bake Off host Sandy Toxford has recruited a host of lovies, including Graham Norton, who you remember made light of these people's plight by referring to Ukraine as Southwest Russia on the BBC. And Miriam Margulies, who said she wanted Boris Johnson to die of COVID, uh, but I've been recruited to show more compassion to those in need of help. Let Ukraine's refugees into the UK now with open arms. 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 I actually can't watch. It's making my skin crawl. Look, Brits don't need a bunch of patronising celebrities to tell them that helping Ukrainians is the right thing to do. You lot out there raised £150 million in a single week for the Disaster Emergency Committee's Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, which, of course, is just one of countless charity drives. But with 4,000 visas already issued to Ukrainians who are expected to arrive by the end of this week and host families receiving a mere £350 a month to supporting them, is it fair to expect the British public to provide refuge for what will ultimately be tens of thousands of people, especially when just one cabinet minister out of 30 Transport Secretary Grant Shapps uh, confirmed to GB News today that they intend to participate? Carol Malone, I'm really not liking mm. this whole feeling that unless you go on television or you tell your friends or you post on Facebook that you're allowed, that you're going to take a Ukrainian refugee into your home, that somehow you're not caring and that you don't understand the plight. It's actually not practical for a lot of people to do this. We're, we're in the midst of a mm. cost of living crisis, the type that we haven't seen in a generation. £350 isn't a lot of money. It's peanuts. You know, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis and, and people people's bills will go up by that much probably every couple of months. But, you know, but, but this, I think there's a narrative forming here, and this is what disturbs me. One, I don't want the government to put the entire responsibility for housing Ukrainian refugees on the British public, because this government should have... They had plenty of warning. They knew this was coming. They should have had accommodations ready. However, that doesn't mean to say that the Brits, who are incredibly warm-hearted, incredibly deep-pocketed, are not going to do their bit. Yes, they they are. And, and the numbers you've just mentioned, I absolutely expected that to be the case. But there is a narrative developing here, and, and I see it. And I, I've seen it with every politician that's been interviewed. Presenters and interviewers are now saying to every politician, 
will you take mm. a refugee in? And, and if the, the politician hesitates or says, I'm not sure about my circumstances yet or whatever, the narrative is that you don't care about Ukrainians, therefore you have no right to talk about it. And that's the narrative that's developing. You know, if people take Ukrainians in, good on them, God bless them, and it's a fantastic thing to do. But if you don't or can't take a Ukrainian into your home, not many, that many people have two or three spare rooms. If you can't do that, you should not be judged on the basis of that. People will do it if it, kindness is not about being judged. They, you know, these, the people who are taking Ukrainians are showing kindness and compassion, but people, if they can't, or even don't want to, they shouldn't be judged on that. But and Esther, know, Esther, we, we uh, call me cynical, but we see this all the time yeah. from these woke virtual signaling celebrities. Now, I'll bet you a hundred pounds yes. that there's no way yeah. in hell Benedict Cumberbatch is going to end up with a Ukrainian refugee in his house. He was on the red carpet and he felt like he had if to he virtue does, he signal. he posted yeah. that person's face on his front door, I can guarantee. You know, the, the thing is, this is entirely because we have to understand the people running our government, as hard as, this, as it is to believe, they're more intelligent than they seem. This is entirely a PR move. This is yeah. DIY asylum programme, um, as Keir Starmer <laughs> was saying. But the issue here is, actually taking in refugees is a very complex undertaking. Jeez. I read recently yes. that, you know, four in ten refugees that are taken into the United Kingdom are... are no, sorry. Oh, um, most refugees that are taken into the United Kingdom are put into, like, four, four major cities in the UK, mm. right? Because they need access to resources to truly mm. integrate and assimilate in the country. You can't stick them in the highlands of Scotland and expect them to integrate. It's a very complex undertaking. It actually involves a lot of governmental resources. So to say, we're going to give you fuel money, effectively what people spend on fuel money every month, £350, mm. to take in a Ukrainian refugee is completely it's absurd. But it's, it's a PR move because it makes it seem like they're doing something about but, it. Be Benjamin but Butterworth, does your skin crawl when you see these woke, virtue signaling, <laughs> lovely <laughs> celebrities? I think it's crawling now, but it's not because of that. I know. <laughs> Look, Dan, I say this with open arms. <laughs> oh, oh, God! God. <laughs> you know, you'll, be, you'll be taking a Ukrainian refugee in, no doubt, or at least saying that you will. <laughs> well, I'm a millennial living in a big city, so I'm lucky to be able to pay for my own bedroom, let alone oh, a wow. second person's bedroom. But, but look, you know, the thing is that you, the idea that you attack people because they are being caring and compassionate and having open arms, as that video No, they're, said, talk, they're that talking. Is, that isn't a fair thing. These are people that are spreading a good message that people that will take in a refugee that do have that resources, they are doing something fantastic. Why don't they actually the people, do it? As you know, these celebrities are talking. I never get to the end of Yes, you do. Show. You can't swear. These people... <laughs> are talking about it. The 25 or 25,000 Brits have actually volunteered to do something about it, which is an entirely different thing. Exactly. But, you know, £350 a month isn't enough. It's if nothing. you foster a child in this country, you get four to £700 a week. So to put that in context, you know, the government knows this isn't the cost of looking after an additional person. Now, these Ukrainian refugees, many of them will probably speak English if they've chosen to come here. They're probably quite skilled people. They're people yeah. that we should want. That's why it was yes, so exactly. stupid that the doors were closed, especially especially when there were quite a lot of job vacancies at the moment. The problem is, but also, we are this... broke. But the I country what... is broke. No, but... And every single week, Carol, I see new demands for no. new big spending. And we're broke. No, and, and the thing is, up until this week, they weren't going to be allowed to work. Ukrainians, you know, mm. will want to work. Yeah, They're yeah. a very proud people. No, and, that and, was a ridiculous and, decision. And, and when so you, I'm glad when, that's... When you go church. to work, you earn your own money and you don't just yeah. get what the state decides to give you. So you're, you're earning your own yes. money. Plus, you're integrating in a community, which is what we yeah. want for them. But, I'm but, sorry, but, 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 but let me just finish this point as well. The, the, 30, the, 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 the 350 quid a month is ridiculous because mm. if the government were paying for a family. They, they were charged that per day to stay in a hotel. Yeah. So what they're doing is what you just said is kind of... It's, it's a like PR refugee move. on well, the street. Well, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm sorry Benjamin. Benjamin. Carol, but no. my well, I'm sorry. The, the irony for of family. the fact that they are spending thousands of pounds a month to house in posh hotels, the illegal refugees yes, who are exactly. coming on the small boats migrants, across the channel. They're yes. asylum. Sorry, migrants, sorry, yeah. sorry, no, they're sorry. Not that, sorry, they're not. They're economic migrants yeah, and, and, and Esther's completely migrants. right to pick the me up on that. The ONHCR says 70% I mean, are not. 
the so fact, the fact that, that everyone and, and, and much of the country is saying, oh, we want Ukrainian refugees, shows the racism in this country. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The fact on, that they will uh, take the white refugees, wait, but wait. all those Syrian oh, refugees oh, and Middle oh, East refugees... Oh, come on. Give over, Benjamin. How it's, dare you turn this into a matter of race? How dare race. you? So this is a country that has been invaded by Russia. The people who are coming across the channel, in the most part, are economic migrants who are already hold in on. France and are, and are here and you to cheat the, the system. So right. how dare you turn this into an issue of race? You're politicising this, and it's not. It's, this is not. This is humanitarian. It's not political. And people have responded. You think to the colour of the Ukrainian skin makes any difference make to this? Benjamin? It clearly does. The attitude to this country, because these refugees are in no more crisis. They're in a terrible Shame on crisis you. than the ones who've what? been coming from Shame Syria on and, you. and Yemen and other countries across the Shame world. Shame on you! For so long. Shame on you! And do you know what this proves? Do you know what this proves, now? Benjamin? The left will turn everything these days into a race baiting story, and it why, actually makes me sick, it, Esther Krakow. It, it makes me Ukrainian sick, Esther. I'm, I'm so I'm so embarrassed to have heard that. Right it is. Now. It, I'm so embarrassed. So You're comparing people fleeing from their lives from literally bombing raids no, to no, no. illegal economic migrants I'm comparing who are the crossing reaction. the channel. I'm comparing the reaction. Why would we want to take? Why would Why would anybody want to, to take on illegal economic migrants fleeing the channel from the dangerous hellscape that is France? You know full well they're yeah. not fleeing France. They're fleeing countries. They're that already in France. They're in France. They're already they in have to France. Yes. And yes. stop race baiting. Where do you think stop Ukrainians race baiting are about this? Come here? Stop race Where baiting do you think the about Ukrainians this. Are? Well, they're in a whole load of places actually, Benjamin. France. Some of them are in Poland. They're in France. Some of them are in France. The Eurostar. the Eurostar said no need to, to go by any other means. We'll put you in the train for free. A good thing for the this Eurostar. This is not an issue of race. But tell me, why were the other This is not an issue of race. And by the way, Benjamin, by the way, Benjamin, you might think that Brits are a country full of races. I say we are the most racially tolerant country in the world. And I think it, well, you, 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 you shame refugee? the country. You, what does that have to do with anything? Why don't you take a Syrian What refugee? does that have to because do with anything? After you, after you are just proving oh, really? Carol's but point. That is exactly what, what we cannot be doing. You know, that is using these people's hellish situation to have a go at him. And you can't do that. You can't so have wrong. a go at anyone so who's wrong. not taking them in. Stop race baiting. Anyway, their slogan is have it your way, but Burger King have today introduced one big caveat at their flagship UK restaurant, but not if you're a carnivore. Yes, BK have pulled a woke whopper of a publicity stunt by enforcing an all-vegan menu at their Leicester Square branch for an entire month. 15 meat-free items are up for grabs, including non-dairy ice cream and a variety of burgers made with vegan cheese and fake bacon. <laughs> Bacon, they call it. Burger King said the menu was a celebration of plant-based innovation is committed to making half its menu permanently meat-free by 2030. But as far as I'm concerned, ditching delicious meat to appease vegan extremists is an act of cowardice. See what I did there? Mm. Cowardice. <laughs> and finally, it's not just Burger King, who is seemingly now terrified of eggs. French presidential candidate Eric Zemmour, described as the country's answer to Donald Trump, got splattered on the noggin while on the campaign trail in southwest France at the weekend. Ooh. The 70-year-old culprit, there he is, who was tackled by Zemmour's yeah. security detail and then removed by police, was angered by the politician's call to put disabled pupils in okay. special schools. The incident, is, it's actually a literal throwback, isn't it, to one of the best moments in UK political history when then Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott lamped a pro-hunting protester in Wales in 2001. Sad to see, isn't it, because the Labour Party, they just don't make them like Prescott anymore. And I think Zamor, <laughs> he would have stormed home in the presidential uh, first vote if he had just given that guy, you know, a bit of a whack. <laughs> Not that I encourage violence, <laughs> but if someone ate me, you know what I'm saying? Aaron Malone, Benjamin Butterworth, Esther Crack, who do stand by. Because coming up, as J.K. Rowling slams Keir Starmer's claim that trans women are women and savages the Labour Party's commitment to women's rights, who's correct in the battle for defining gender? We'll debate that at 10.30. But next, does the failure of COVID jabs to curtail cases prove that policies like vaccine passports not only morally wrong, but completely ineffective? Cyril Cohen, a vaccine advisor for booster-loving Israel, answers that and more as he gives evidence evidence in my lockdown inquiry straight after the break.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Israel's vaccine chief Cyril Cohen is next to give evidence in the lockdown inquiry. Israel was said to lead the world as it rolled out the COVID vaccine with startling efficiency thanks to a deal with big pharma company Pfizer. But its jabs failed to be the silver bullet they were promised to be. By January 29th, Israel had given its trailblazing booster jabs to 65% of its population, while nearly 600,000 over 60s had received a fourth jab. But on that same day, the country topped the world for new COVID cases per capita, as they recorded 26,186 per million people. So, as the data proves vaccines fail to stop transmission, is it time for the world to accept that jabs are not the way to avoid future lockdowns? And does it also prove that policies like vaccine passports are not only morally wrong, but completely ineffective? Well, to try and answer some of these questions is world-renowned immunologist and the Israeli government's top vaccine advisor, Cyril Cohen. And Cyril, it's absolutely fascinating to have you here because, of course, Israel was thought to be a world leader in terms of rolling out the jab so quickly. But it didn't stop transmission at all, did it? I think in the era of the... Uh, first of all, good evening, Dan. Good evening. You know, I think the, in the... Yeah, I think that in the era of the Omicron, yeah, it's no longer relevant. I mean, we do know that the potency of those vaccines in order to prevent transmission is very low. Uh, we have even data that show that, you know, for the false dose, uh, it can only prevent that by 30 percent. So I think that today we came to realize that there is a problem uh, with basing the whole strategy only on these vaccines. But on the other hand, I want to maintain that vaccines are saving lives and are saving lives every day because vaccines can prevent severe disease. And today in Israel, if you compare people that do, did not get vaccinated to people that get vaccinated with uh, uh, three doses, you can see that you are 10 times less at risk to develop a severe disease if you are vaccinated with three doses. But surely, surely, Cyril, that is only relevant for the vulnerable and the elderly. Not necessarily. If you, if you take the data of people below the age of 60, you will still see 
that there is a three to four times less risk to develop a severe disease if you are fully vaccinated, meaning three doses. So I think it's still relevant. The vaccine is saving lives, whether you are over the age of 60 or below the age of 60. But that's true that the proportion of people below the age of 60 at the era of the Omicron is lower than, of course, people over the age of 60. But what about vaccine damage? Have you actually looked yet and, and compared the, the damage that, that vaccinating young people numerous times is doing in terms of conditions like myocarditis uh, compared to COVID? Yes, so basically we have compared that early on. We were actually the first country to report on myocarditis and we were able to measure frequency of uh, around one in 3,000 to one in 6,000, uh, I would say, adolescents to the age of 25 that developed myocarditis. But still, if you compare that to the risk of developing a myocarditis because of the virus, not of the vaccine, it's still lower. So still, I think that at that time, it was the right call to make. Today, with the Omicron, I think that there is less incentive because it is causing less severe disease, especially uh, in, in the young people, as I just said earlier. So there is less incentive, perhaps, to vaccinate or immunize kids between the age of 5 to 11. And one proof to that is the fact that in Israel, only 20 or 25 percent of the kids between the age of 5 to 11 actually got vaccinated. Well, indeed. And you look at Florida Governor DeSantis, for example, who is now actively discouraging children uh, being vaccinated. Do, do, do you think actually we need to move towards that path internationally? Because Pfizer, of course, is saying, no, 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 we, we want to do the fourth jab for everyone. I don't know if Pfizer is saying that they want to do the fourth job for everyone. I don't know if this is the case. I can tell you that in, in I would say in, in general, uh, we have to think again how we're going to manage this pandemic because COVID is not going anywhere. It's still around us. And if you ask me, I think that our, uh, I would say our vision should be to combine vaccines in order to prevent severe disease, especially for the more vulnerable people, using also treatment. But I think that also uh, natural exposure will have its role to play in that, because we do know that uh, there is uh, some um, evidences that, uh, I don't want to say natural immunity. Herd immunity, uh, come on, say it, herd <laughs> immunity. It's that no. great phrase. It's what we want, right? Hallelujah, yes, herd immunity. Yes, but I want to say that I'm not encouraging anyone to get, you know, exposed on purpose. What I'm saying well, no, is that... But it's sort of impossible to avoid, isn't it? J just let me tell you what the Pfizer CEO, Albert Berler, said. This was on Sunday uh, okay. to CBS. He said, right now, the way that we have seen it is necessary, a fourth booster right now. Based on the evidence that you've seen in Israel, do you agree with yes. that? I don't know to whom, I mean, to whom you will administer this false dose. What we have, the data we have right now is that a false dose for the most vulnerable people can reduce the risk by three to four times of severe disease. But for younger people right now, I don't think that there is a, a real incentive to go and give a false dose, especially that this vaccine is based on the, uh, I would say, older strain of the virus. Cyril, two other quick points I wanted to raise with you. Uh, number one, you must now concede that vaccine passports or, or green passes, as you called them in Israel, they are completely nonsense, aren't they? No country should be using vaccine passports. They're pointless. Yes, I, I think that at the era of the Omicron, it's it's no longer relevant. I mean, the point is that you see even countries uh, that have adopted a zero COVID policy, like Hong Kong, are now struggling against oh, yeah. COVID. So unless Pathetic. you have a very, very Pathetic. strong no, well, policy. I, yeah. yeah, well, I'm glad no, we I'm agree with that. And, and, yeah. and finally, uh, do you concede that we all across the world, I know you did in Israel, we did in the UK, we were wrong to shut down schools, to stop children 
being educated over the course of the pandemic. Yes. Yes, that uh, I fully agree. I mean, I was even, you know, at the Israeli parliament trying to argue for leaving schools open, I'm saying in September 2020. Uh, I think that we should have made more efforts to keep our kids at school, uh, you know, even, you know, split classrooms, using air purifiers, all that stuff. And I'm not saying that kids are not getting infected by the virus, but I think that there, are, yeah. there was a, a tough price to pay in, you know, using Zoom and not sending our kids Indeed. to school. No, I think it was shameful. Well, look, I'm glad that we agree on that. That was head of immunology at Baralan University and member of the Israeli government's advisory committee for vaccines, one of the vaccine geniuses in Israel, Cyril Cohen. But we're coming to some agreement there. Coming up, our hopes of ending the war with a new Russian revolution, a fatal underestimation of Putin's popularity at home. Author and broadcaster Konstantin Kissin has been researching this and has a word of warning for the West in Uncancelled at 10.40. But next in the media buzz, as J.K. Rowling slams Keir Starmer's claim that trans women are women, who's correct in the battle for defining gender? My superstar panel returns straight after the break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now on our Media Buzz. Lots more front pages just in. The Daily Mirror reports the terrible news that uh, three Brits are feared to have been killed in a missile strike in Ukraine. The ex-Special Forces trio are believed to have been lost in yesterday's attack on the Yavoriv air base near the Polish border. The Daily Express also leads with the tragic news. Uh, it came during Putin's cruise missile attack. On the front page of the Daily Telegraph, Boris Johnson says that the West made a terrible mistake when they continued to rely on Russian oil and gas after the 2014 annexation of Crimea. Completely agree. Uh, so this is a written piece, so the Prime Minister returning to write for his old newspaper, uh, where he's accused Putin of using Russian energy supplies for blackmail. And he added quite correctly, we cannot go on like this. Also on the front page, US intelligence claims China are prepared to send weapons as well as economic aid to Russia in support of its invasion of Ukraine. Well, shame on them. The Guardian reports Russian forces kept up their relentless bombardment of Ukrainian cities today as it was revealed nearly three million have left the country. The paper also features the brave Kremlin-controlled media employee who staged a protest on set during one of Russia's most popular news programs. We'll bring you that footage very shortly. 44,000 people have signed up to give refugee a home, refugees a home. Well, the numbers just keep increasing each paper we get in. Great news, though. The official website for the government scheme was overwhelmed within minutes of launching with 
1,500 people signing up inside an hour. Also on the front page, the Duchess of Cambridge, who dazzled today in Princess Diana's sapphires. The Times also reports that tens of thousands of Britons have offered to open their homes to Ukrainian refugees. It pictures sanctioned Chelsea owner Roman Abramovich there. He was uh, caught by photographers at an airport in Tel Aviv before a jet linked to him departed for Istanbul. And heavens, declares the Daily Star, at claims by so-called history egghead David Atkins that the famed Turin Shroud is in fact a tablecloth made in Burton upon Trent. So certainly a change of pace there. <laughs> My superstar panel back now, Daily Express columnist Karen Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and the social commentator Esther Kraku. Now, some of Lady Labour's uh, leading female front benches had a disturbingly tough time providing the definition of a woman last week as they refused to go down what they bizarrely branded a rabbit hole. But Keir Starmer demonstrated some uncharacteristic conviction when he was asked the question during an interview with the Times newspaper. He replied... A woman is a female adult, and in addition to that, trans women are women. And that is not just my view, that is, the actually, that is actually the law. It has been the law through the combined effects of the 2004 Gender Recognition Act and the 2010 Equality Act. So that's my view. It also happens to be the law in the United Kingdom. But Starmer's comments, not surprisingly, sparked a furious backlash, most notably from J.K. Rowling, who's on the front line now in the fight for women's rights. The Harry Potter author tweeted, I don't think our politicians have the slightest idea how much anger is building among women from all walks of life at the attempts to threaten and intimidate them out of speaking about their own rights, their own bodies and their own lives. Among the thousands of letters and emails I've received to disillusioned members of Labour, the Greens, the Lib Dems and the SNP, women are scared outraged and angry at the deaf air turn to their well-found concerns. But women are organising. Now Keir Starmer publicly misrepresents equality's law and yet another indication that the Labour Party can no longer be counted on to defend women's rights. But I repeat, women are organising across party lines and their resolve and their anger are growing. So who's right in the battle to define a woman? Uh, Benjamin Butterworth, J.K. Rowling or Keir Starmer? Well, here we go. <laughs> No, but I mean, the law is absolutely clear. There's, there's no question mark about, about what the law... So you say Keir Starmer's right? I mean, but, well, hang on. There's, there's a debate. But it's a simple question. Well, Keir Starmer is right, yes. Okay. And it, it's absolutely right, because under law, someone who is a transgender woman or man, for that matter, there was just as many transgender men as transgender women, uh, who has got their passport changed, a gender recognition certificate, is legally a woman on all of their documents. So, you know, the question was about the law. The law's been that case for nearly 18 years. Well, Esther, it wasn't just a question of the law last week, though, was it? It was about what the definition of a woman is. And, and the Labour Party will not say it's an adult human female. They will not say that. You see, th it shouldn't be a controversial statement, regardless of what party you support, to say that the standard of our politicians is no longer good enough. It's just not good enough. This is half the country he wants to lead, and he cannot define what a woman is. His entire party can't define what a woman is. This is absolutely absurd. And you know what? I, the people I actually feel the most sorry for are actually transgender people in this instance, because I believe that most, the majority of them just want to be left to live their lives. Maybe I personally don't recognise a trans woman as a woman, because in my view, it's still a biological male. But that's besides the point. how are they the meant to live their lives? When however, you way they, how, just, however way they just, choose. Just, however, we cannot, we cannot negate biological realities to appease a small group of people. And I think for, this, for the minority of trans people that are actually trying to push this narrative mm. that trans women are actually women, they're making it difficult for trans people that just want to live their lives mm. outside. There are trans people who recognise that trans women are still biological men. You know, it's not and a they're negotiation. In the majority it, no, it's not a negotiation. It's a they fact. Don't, don't, Did you do G GCSE biology? Did you do GCSE biology? I got an A. Oh, good Lord. If you got an A in GCSE biology, you can't define what a man Didn't do a level. is. I, th the country is doomed. I give up. Carol Malone, who's right? J.K. Rowling or Keir oh, Starmer? J.K. Rowling. You know, Starmer is an abject coward. He talks about the law, but the bottom line is it's a biological fact. You just described the, the dictionary, both Oxford and Cambridge, definition of a woman is a human female as biologically determined by the XX chromosome, and that is fact. Starmer's a coward, 
as is Yvette Cooper, which is slightly worse for me, uh, as is Annalise Dodds. <laughs> Annalise Dodds Why is, is the, the worst for you? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Annalise Dodds is the minister, shadow minister for women in this country. <laughs> and yet, she was unable to define what a woman is. Her, her phrase last week, like, when she was asked what a woman was, she said, it depends on the context. No, it damn well doesn't. Oh. Cooper was the one who said, you know, I'm not, yes, I know what I want, but I, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. And why? Because these three are terrified of offending the woke mob. They're terrified of offending the tiny People trans like Benjamin. activists. But, but, but like more Benjamin. importantly, in doing what they do, they are insulting... People like you, Benjamin. They are insulting <laughs> women. And they are, they are denying women's rights. Benjamin, why are you so obsessed about erasing Sorry, female obsessed. gender. Why the can they, why can they the not be women Dan, and you. trans women? I, I mean, you know, you talk about trans women, never trans men, oddly enough. You talk about trans women more often than you talk about your Well, because we don't have trans channel. men in oh, men's right. sport, oddly enough. Well, this, uh, there, oh, are, there, are men. Men. there are just Benjamin, as many transgender men as transgender women. That's not true. How many trans men have you... Excuse me, how many trans men have you seen in men's sports? OK, I don't know the fact. How many trans men... the numbers. There's absolutely no evidence that there's a difference in the numbers of people well, that transition. Well, I have read that there are more trans women than No, 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 hold on, hold on. There's an obsession let's, with talking okay, about trans let's, coming let's, in. Please answer this. How many trans men have you seen in men's sports? Since you you don't understand our concern about trans women in women's spaces. Neither the number of trans men nor... No, how trans, many? Hang on. Neither, how many? Neither the number of trans how men many? nor trans women is reflective of the kind of basic how rights many? in law do that you, a transgender person Do you think trans men have. stand a chance against uh, Mike Tyson? But I don't... Hang on. Let's not I have go, said, let's not go I, there. I that's not what this is about. No, but that's the point. That a transgender person, they shouldn't automatically qualify in something. It should be appropriate to their to their physicality. But that, you shouldn't base the rights that a group of people, 99.99% of reality. them, are never, ever going to be competing Just, in the Olympics. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like can, you can, accept basic science. Can I science. make this point? Women... It doesn't feel like you accept the reality of these transgender people that no, want to live their lives do. and have legal protection. Absolutely. Because they can, face a damn sight more abuse than other people. But let's talk about women who have struggled for decades for equal rights in this country. Because of men. And, and now those rights are being denied them. What by rights the, being denied? By, by, well, the right to call themselves a woman and the rights that so they have as women. Spaces. In what way can't you call yourself a woman? Well, well you, you can't because you're Activists told. like you would, yes, would not you describe Carol as a woman. woman. You would describe her as a cis woman. Good Why are you full of balderdash? Of course these two people are women. There also happens to be a very small group of people how, who are slightly more complicated that are women. And, how, and these how people have, the people that are okay. legally recognised have had a full operation okay. and everything. Except that doesn't make them women. That doesn't make them like. What business is it of you? You. And by the way, or me, well, the, La well, well, the Labour Party and the SNP are pushing towards self-ID, remember, which means but that, that already, anyone but this at is, any this time... But just shows your ignorance. But because under the law for the last nearly 18 years, in order to get your gender recognition certificate, that thing that changes the legal effect of who you are... You have to mutilate you have to, your genitals. Can you, no, you don't, can you answer but you have to live, about, Hang listen, on. You but have you're to talking live, all the time, so let somebody else get in. for two years as the yeah. gender you identify to prove Well, this it. shows your so ignorance. Had Liz Truss is trying to change the law. Yeah. We've had... She's not trying to change that law. That's wrong. And that's been the law for she's nearly 18 years. trying to change Jake, the law around self-ID. J.K. Rowling... We don't have a self-ID law that you refer to. J.K. Rowling was talking today about the anger that's building among women because every time any woman speaks out about the trans brigade threatening them, they're cancelled... <laughs> They, they lose their Just jobs, they the lose their careers, brain. they can't talk about their own bodies <laughs> for fear of being cancelled. That is not fair. Well, I tell you what, J.K. Rowling is one of the most bigoted people in this country. She's the opposite And when of she oh. wrote on Twitter that most gay people she knows have said that they're upset about this, how she dare... She didn't say most gay. How she she did. said she had thousands of letters from, from gay people, many of them lesbian, who said they didn't want to be redefined. And I tell you what, I don't know any gay people that think like that, aside you know from you, I suppose. The, the fact that you... Think that J.K. Who Rowling is, is for bigoted men? says everything about why you will lose this debate. Well, now on this it. show, I have twice interviewed Meghan Markle's father Thomas because I think he deserves to give his side of the story over their bust up and expose the disingenuous narrative peddled to the media by the Duchess of Sussex. So I'm delighted that Thomas has just launched his own YouTube channel in order to speak his truth. In the debut episode, Thomas sits down with celebrity photographer and his pal, Carl Larson, to discuss Samantha Markle's defamation of character case against younger sister Meghan. And Thomas makes it abundantly clear which of his daughters he's backing. In this particular case, I think uh, she certainly should win.
I've been trying for almost four years to uh, get to see my uh, my my daughter, my daughter and her her uh, uh, ginger husband uh -huh. in a courtroom. I'd be thrilled to come to court and and talk and defend my oldest daughter. Good for Thomas for speaking out, Carol Malone. Benjamin Butterworth, Esther Crack, who do stand by because coming up, the crowning moment of the show, as I will reveal tonight's greatest Britain and Union jackass. Also coming up, uh, a hopes of a new Russian revolution to remove Putin getting the mood of the country all wrong. Constantine Kisson is uncancelled in just a few seconds' time. First, though, here's what's coming up in tomorrow's show. Coming up on Dan Wharton tonight, as President Zelensky continues to lead the Ukrainian fight back, we'll speak to one of his deputies' closest confidants on the efforts to govern a country under attack. Plus, Homes Under the Hammer and I'm a Celebrity star Martin Roberts checks in from the Ukrainian border after his 26-hour mercy dash to help citizens in need. Is Russia in danger of becoming the next North Korea? Defector and human rights activist Yongmi Park gives her analysis. Plus, I'll break down the day's top headlines with my superstar panel. The former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, the former Tory London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey, and the author and journalist Rebecca Reed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. And breaking tonight, astonishing footage has emerged of a protester storming onto Russia's Channel One news evening broadcast with a sign that read, no war, don't believe the propaganda, they're lying to you here. The woman, who worked as an editor at the channel, now faces up to 15 years in prison for deviating away from the government's approved line. But has coverage of brave protests like this and of the more than 14,000 courageous Russians who have been arrested for anti-war demonstrations created a distorted view of the public opinion surrounding Putin's senseless invasion of Ukraine? There's a growing narrative in the West that there could be something akin to a second Russian revolution to end the war with Putin, destined to be toppled by Kremlin insiders. Russia's first post-Soviet minister, Andrei Kozirev, told The Times this week that the Russian leader was risking a Kremlin coup as discontent grows. Interviews like this have been frequent in the Western media since the war began. But many think we're fatally underestimating Putin's popularity. And one man who has taken the time to speak to ordinary Russian people and study Russian state media is the British Russian author and trigonometry podcast host, Konstantin Kissin, who joins me now. So, Konstantin, is, is this scenario of a palace coup to take Putin out even feasible? And is it actually a case to be careful what you wish for? Well, quite, Dan, and you make a very good point. Now, as you know, I'm, I'm no huge fan of the of the Russian regime at all, but I do think people got to be careful. The, the first thing, as you say, we ought to consider what might replace Vladimir Putin. And I, it, as, a, as a Russian, it is a very sad thing for me to say that, historically speaking, Vladimir Putin is not exactly an outlier in terms of Russian leaders. So the, to imagine that, you know, if he's ousted from power, he's going to be replaced by a Nick Clegg is a little bit optimistic. You might actually find that in the middle of a war, you end up with someone who's far, far worse. So that's the first thing to say. The other thing to say, as you as you mentioned, I've been speaking to people on the ground in Russia and elsewhere. And one of the things I know is that thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Russian people who are against what's happening are leaving the country. So uh, there's a neighboring country to Russia called Armenia. Uh, and uh, some of my family are there at the moment. And they say that normally there's about three to four flights between Russia and Armenia a day. At the moment, there are 42. And that is people fleeing the country. So the people who are against the war are leaving or ending up in prison for the brave protests, as you mentioned. And the other side of it is that ordinary Russians, many of them who only watch state media, which uh, is taken on Goebbels like propaganda levels at this point, uh, they are watching that media and they are persuaded by it. And they believe that what's happening in Ukraine is a so-called Nazi genocide. The Nazis are back and they've taken over Ukraine and they're murdering Russians in their droves. Uh, that's what they believe uh, to the point where we've seen, I don't know if you saw this, Dan, this week, there was a video of a Russian prisoner of war who talked about how shocked he was to discover that on arriving in Ukraine, there weren't swastikas everywhere. So that's what people are being told. And you've got to remember, Russia shut down Facebook, Twitter, 
all Western social media, so people don't have access to to other types of information, even if they were keen to seek it out. And so you've got a situation where a country has essentially locked its informational borders. People are being pr brainwashed into believing a particular narrative. And, you know, it's part of the Russian psyche that we must be strong. We must fight evil. We we, we defeated Nazism 80 years ago in World War II, and we can do it again. Uh, so Putin's and so tapped into that. I understand that. But, Constantine, mm. Uh, do you get any sense that, that Russians, ordinary Russians, are, are starting to feel worried about the economic conditions? You know, all of the Western companies are pulling out of, of the country, the, the, the value of the ruble plummeting. Is that starting to hit home at all? You ask a very good question, Dan, but I think it betrays a misunderstanding, if you don't mind me saying. Yes, no, of Russians are, are, are concerned about the impact of the sanctions, but the question isn't whether they're concerned about the impact of the sanctions. The question is, who do they blame for the sanctions? Who do they blame for the war? And so far... They blame Putin. They don't blame Putin, they blame the West. Uh, they c consider this war to be a product of Western interference in Ukraine. They consider the sanctions to be wrong and illegitimate. And so they're not blaming uh, Vladimir Putin. They consider him to be standing up for their interests and the evil West is meddling in their affairs. And the has country. Putin so had a spike in popularity? Often that is something that happens when a country goes to war. Yes, he has. Now, I, I always say you've got to be careful because polls, I mean, we've seen over the last five years polls in our own country yeah. here are not exactly reliable, <laughs> but it, obviously in an authoritarian country like Russia, even less so. Uh, my own opinion is I don't think these latest polls are inaccurate. I think they're spot on. He has had a bump in popularity. Uh, whether that's going to last is really the question, because your question about sanctions is the good one, Dan. You know, the, the over time, whether the people still blame Vladimir, uh, still blame the West and not Vladimir Putin may be a different case. As things go on, we saw, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Union really was about the fact that the West bankrupted the Soviet Union by putting things in place and forcing uh, the Soviet Union to, to engage in an arms race it couldn't afford. Whether over time people get tired of bread queues and all of the stuff that essentially led to the collapse of the Soviet Union remains to be seen. Absolutely fascinating insight. As always, please do keep in touch with us, Constantine. And I really recommend uh, watching Constantine's trigonometry uh, videos online, which explain all of this a lot more from his perspective. But it's time now to reveal today's greatest Britain in Union Jackass. So let me bring my superstar panel back in. Carol Malone, who are you nominating as your greatest Brit today? Mine are the British people as a nation. Yeah. Their fantastic response to the Ukraine crisis, the millions they've raised in donations, the thousands they've already volunteered to take in refugees, the incredible people who've actually gone to Poland to actually take aid. That's so there. God bless them all. Benjamin Butterworth, what about you? Mine is a little boy called uh, Jax Gladstone, and Jack, or Jax Walker, apparently. Uh, and he basically did a little sale in his community. He sold loads of cakes and has now raised nearly 400 pounds to give to the people Good. in Ukraine because he wanted to do his bit to help them. And I just thought, he said to his, he said, there are so many kind people out there, mummy. And I thought, what a lovely statement. And Esther Kraku, I think your nominee might yes. annoy Benjamin a little bit. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Good. It's J.K. Rowling for not doing what many celebrities in her position would have done, which is to retreat into her comfortable lifestyle. She's actually decided to defend the rights of women to be women. It's incredible, right? I'm actually going to go uh, with Carol tonight, though, because the British people have been great. Uh, we are opening our homes up when we can. We're donating money. And I think Carol was right earlier when she said we, we shouldn't judge individuals for whatever route they choose to take. But what we are doing is we are supporting the Ukrainian people in lots of different ways. Union Jackass time. Carol Malone, your nominee. OK, mine's John Burke. A week ago, <laughs> the former common speaker was branded a bully in a city reliant, banned from Parliament for life. Uh, it was a finding he refused to accept. Uh, but now we discover that apparently in August last year, police were called to his house on what was believed to be a late night bus trip. It's believed his wife, Sally, called the cops. So he spent forever telling everyone he's not a bully at all. And hey, his wife called the cops on him, his own wife. Benjamin Butterworth. Uh, mine is the Chelsea Football Club fans, uh, the ones that have claimed <laughs> they're being attacked because of Abramovich's sanctions. They are knuckle-dragging fools who think football is bigger uh, than war. You are uh, clearly not a football fan. You're such a scumbag. <laughs> Mr. Kraku, your nominee. 
It should be Benjamin. It's yeah. Benjamin. You're not, allowed, you're not allowed to go. You can choose him every week. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's, it has to be. It should be him, really. <laughs> no, um, it's to behave. <laughs> Just made me forget who my Union Jackass was. It's the BAFTA Award celebrities. Because oh, nice. while they were all happy to be smiling, maskless, showing their, their, grinning their teeth and telling the world how inferior we are to them, the people that were actually organising and helping at the BAFTAs were all masked yeah. up. I so That's agree, incredible. Esther. I'm going with you. The Union Jackasses, all of those BAFTA celebrities and Rebel Wilson too. Let me throw her in there. Carol Malone, Benjamin Butterworth, Esther Kraku, my fabulous Monday Night Superstar panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll be back again tomorrow at 9pm. Thank you for your company tonight. Headliners is next. Good night. Good evening. Turning a bit misty in a few places overnight. Could be some early fog patches around tomorrow. But once that's gone, for the vast majority, it's going to be a dry, fine day. A bit chilly first thing, but um, quite mild by the afternoon. The UK is surrounded by weather fronts, but um, they're not really making much in the way of rainfall. This one approaching the northwest will bring a wetter day tomorrow across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. We do have some showery rain across the northeast of Scotland this evening. That is fizzling away. One or two scattered showers over East Anglia and the southeast, uh, but equally they are pretty well scattered and most places are dry, but we are going to see some mist and fog patches forming across parts of the Midlands and southern England and temperatures dropping down close to freezing, certainly in rural spots a touch of frost to start Tuesday, but generally a fine sunny start. The mist and fog patches in the south will only take a few hours to clear away, but they could easily be there through the morning rush out. There's that weather front coming in, bringing some rain to the highlands, the Western Isles, and more western parts of Northern Ireland. But I say ahead of it, most places dry and bright, and temperatures, look at that, across England and Wales, 13 in Manchester, 13 or 14 in Norwich, maybe 15 or 16 in London. Cooler with the rain, edging into Western Scotland and Northern Ireland, that continues to track through the central belt and across uh, through uh, the Belfast area during the course of the evening and um, some uncertainty about the position of that line of rain on Wednesday, joined by another weather front bringing uh, a different day for the Midlands and the eastern parts of England on Wednesday with more cloud and some outbreaks of rain that could be heavy in places as well. For the west, it's looking like it'll turn drier and brighter, certainly a brighter day for Western Scotland, Northern Ireland. Temperatures similar, whereas again, of course, the east, that's where we'll have the highest temperatures. And if we see some sunshine poking through, we could get up to 15 or 16 degrees. A few showers across the north on Thursday, but apart from that, into the weekend, plenty of sunshine and temperatures widely in the teens. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News.